Good morning, everybody. Today I'll be talking about a paper that I did a few from a few years back. This this project has been probably five to six years in the making, and it's a systematic review on fetal testosterone and its effect on sexual differentiation. So this project started off, I think, in 2013 or 2014, and um, I managed to mold it into systematic review form in 2000 and around 2018. We'll talk more about that. And this work of um, fetal testosterone, of sex differences, and of extreme male brain theory in particular came from a 2003 book by Dr. Baron Cohen from the University of Cambridge. He's the uh, he's a cousin of uh, Sasha Baron Cohen, and um, he talked about an idea that actually goes way back to the inception of autism. And Hans Asperger um, and his colleagues as well they thought that autism had something to do with an extreme pattern of of the male brain that. They, people who have autism show traits that males tend to be already high in. For example, rough and tumble play. Uh, for example, perhaps being less interested in people and so on. And so Dr. Baron Cohen in his 2003 work reviewed some of the work that he did with fetal testosterone really was the most direct test of fetal testosterone. And so the idea has to do with fetal testosterone in the womb. And the idea is that within a critical period, as you can see on the right, that between 12 and 24 weeks, um, there is a large spike in testosterone levels in the male fetus. And it's thought that exposure of fetal testosterone in this period would have permanent effects of enduring effects on the brain and enduring effects on the formation of the sex of the child in particular. So if you look at the middle diagram, uh, these constructs were talked about in the 2003 book and in later uh, articles, and it's the idea of brain types. So two constructs here. One is empathizing, and empathizing psychometrically overlaps significantly with agreeableness and with um, affective theory of mind. And so it has to do with uh, people being interested in people, in interested in caring for people, in interested in responding to people's distress. And systemizing has to do with an interest in, in things that if you were to manipulate one factor in a system, um, you'd be interested to find the outcome uh, for the entire system, whether something sig significant was changed. And so for systemizing, it was related to things like taxonomy. So there are people who are interested, for example, in the names of plants, the names of species, um, the bi binomial nomenclature of animals, for instance. Um, or you could have things like topology. There are those who are interested in maps, interested in subway systems, and there are those who are interested in taking apart toasters and machines and doing your doing your yourself projects. Um, and so Empathizing was found to actually predict entry into the humanities among university students, and systemizing predicted the entry into science. And it's said that we have a combination of empathizing and systemizing, and it's argued that if you have a higher than empathizing um, typology, in terms of systemizing, you would have a type S brain, which is more male. And if you have more empathizing than you do systemizing, then it's 
uh, a E type of brain, which is more female. And it's the idea of the, that the extreme form of type S has to do with autism. So Baron Cohen brings data to back up his claims. They found that for 12 months, that females had higher number of eye contact per 20 minutes. And they found that fetal testosterone had um, an, a relationship across the sexes in predicting eye contact. So it seemed like fetal testosterone was mediating the sexual differentiation of the sexes in terms of eye contact. And at 18 months, there was a superiority in females in terms of vocabulary. And once again, there was some kind of mediation of fetal testosterone. And at 48 months, the quality of social relationships and restricted interest uh, were both predicted by fetal testosterone in reg separate regression analyses. So it meant that higher fetal testosterone, a person would be more restricted in, in their interest. It's thought that those who have autism, they have very narrow interests, and perhaps fetal testosterone was related to that. And the idea of fetal testosterone also to do has to do with the lateralization of brain function. It's thought that males tend to have more lateralized um, brain configuration in terms of language, that it's more concentrated on the left hemisphere, that language is more represented at the left hemisphere than both hemispheres. So this is another uh, way to capture the theory. So this theory has received a range of feedback, some of them positive, some of them negative, some of them are very negative. And uh, nature had thought that this was a very interesting avenue for additional research and certainly has generated a lot of research, especially in terms of psychometric testing. Um, but his work was also criticized by feminists who thought that his work perpetuated a kind of sexism. Um, the idea that the sexes um, is hardwired into the brain is to them antithetical to, uh, to progressive thinking. And so that brings me to, uh, to my background and why I'm interested in this issue. I'm a first year PhD student part-time. I was thankfully admitted by Dr. Doug Mara and Dr. Uh, Dr. Joe. And we're hoping to look at issues of theory of mind and consciousness. I've been specializing in psychology and neuroscience since early 20, 2012. And, um, and I, I did this in the University of Toronto where there was a lot of student activity revolving around gender issues. There were a number of uh, protests against groups who were advocating for men's mental health. Um, you can see a picture of that here between a lady and a police officer trying to keep peace. Um, and there were there was a speech, a free speech uh, rally in 2017 in front of Sidney Smith. Uh, but really what got me interested in this topic had to do with a course in the philosophy of science where I study the works of Evelyn Fox Keller and others. And they revealed to me how females bring a very unique perspective to the natural world, two constructs that are of immense interest to scientists today, things like consciousness um, and people. I think people are progressively becoming more interested in people in part, at least, because there is an increase in female voices um, in positions of power, in positions of authority, in positions of uh, research. So 
I thought what better way to understand the nature of knowledge than to study sex differences and its related ideas. And that's not to say that um, my views are exclusionist to any social constructivist ideas of sex differences, but this is just a start in terms of understanding um, one aspect of it. And certainly the, the literature currently um, does not favor any partisan views. So we submitted an earlier paper to Psychological Bulletin, one of the uh, more pre prestigious journals. And one of their comments was that, you know, there there's actually, most researchers today subscribe to some form of biosocial, biopsychosocial view where they incorporate the social and the biological. So talking about the biological does not preclude the social. I think it in some ways enriches it. So the, the aim of the systematic review was to look at the cohort or longitudinal studies that looked at fetal testosterone from 12 to 24 weeks uh, to predict later behavior, especially pertaining to autism symptoms, especially pertaining to autism-related cognitions, social outcomes, play styles, and other behavioral indices. And in so doing, we will see how well the extreme male brain theory of autism is faring in light of recent research. I remember as I was first starting this research, um, somebody else in the uh, department told my supervisor, you know, there's no, basically there was a new study that came out that disproved the whole thing. I'm like, well, we'll see about that. And it turns out he's wrong. So to continue, uh, testing for the extreme male brain theory. Um, I thought that it would be very important to outline two aspects that makes the extreme male brain theory um, that determines whether the data supports a paper supports the extreme male brain theory or not. And the first criteria has to do with, number one, whether there is any sex differences at all for fetal testosterone to differentiate um, the brain in a sex dimorphic way, it would have to, well, you, you'll have to find sex differences to begin with. That seems pretty simple. And so here in this paper, um, you, you can ignore most of it and just focus on the, the highlighted portion. This paper looked at the autism quotient and the child autism spectrum quotient. And it was found that there was a large, large uh, effect size, a large difference between males and females on the autism quotient, and uh, a smaller uh, difference in the cast, which is a different autism measure. And the second criteria has to do with whether fetal testosterone would survive a regression analysis with sex being part of it. So fetal testosterone would have to predict for this dimension, above and beyond the um, gender of the child, the sex of the child. And in this particular study, there was support of that. Uh, not only was the autism quotient significantly different between males and females, the fetal testosterone levels were predictive of autism quotient above and beyond sex and also above and beyond uh, the presence of an older sister. Certainly, there's, it doesn't hurt to include more confounds and control more variables in these kinds of studies. And so the verdict for this particular study in terms of whether it supports the extreme male brain, brain theory is that it does. So a brief run-through of how I conducted the systematic review. I used the Ovid research platform that allowed me to look at different databases simultaneously. And some of these allowed looking at the gray literature. Some of them allowed looking at theses. Um, I didn't focus on that, but I did include preprints from Medline and PsychInfo and some other databases that you can find in the paper itself.
And so after selecting for the databases, I put in the key terms that is um, represented by PICO. And PICO is short for Population Intervention Comparison Outcome. And so we defined what we're interested in for each of these dimensions. So for population, we had neurotypical children, and indeed most of the studies done on fetal testosterone had to do with neurotypical children. Intervention had to do with fetal testosterone. And we are very particular in terms of selecting for um, amniocentesis tested fetal testosterone. If you remember uh, one of the pictures earlier, amniocentesis is when a needle is put into the womb in the period of uh, between 12 and 24 weeks, and the fluid is taken out, and the fluid is subject to a biological assay. Uh, fetal testosterone will be one of the things that they can look at. We picked this in particular because we found, at least I found, other measures to be wanting. For example, there's the idea that the second and fourth digit ratio of a person's hand also predict the level of fetal testosterone exposure. Um, that has certainly not been substantiated by research, and uh, it certainly doesn't help because that research conflicts with the amniocentesis research. So there's some discrepancy there, um, and there needs to be more, more study on that. Nevertheless, it is very clear that fetal testosterone is more purely tested by amniocentesis. There may be, pro you know, you, you can compare it to, for example, fetal blood, um, and it seems to be a different measure. Umbib umbib uh, umbilical cord blood also seems to be a different measure. And it's the fetal testosterone in particular that we're interested in. And so the other criteria has to do with male versus female. And it has to be a study that contains both male and female participants, uh, male and female children. So if the study only had males or only had females, we would have taken it out. You can't really compare extreme male brain theory if you only had one um, one type. And so um, the outcome had to do with autism-related individual differences. So this is not just autism symptoms, but also autism-related cognition. Restricted interest is one of the things that we talked about. Um, also social relationship, communication, social perception, vocabulary, eye gaze, uh, these were all fair game. And once we had a nice pool of studies from, um, from Ovid, which is very user-friendly, you basically put in all the search terms related to PICO in, independently. It will be put in different lines. And once they are... Um, Put in, they're, they're remembered by the system, and then you can class them together as I did here. Tick them off one by one, and then search with a combined AND term. And so for each of these, you'll find maybe thousands of search results that come up, but once you put them together with an AND statement, uh, then you get to about, I believe it was a few hundred studies. So you can extract that bibliography from Ovid and put it into Covidence. Covidence is a very good software for systematic reviews, and it offers you a free uh, review per email. And it's a software where you can use to select out of the studies that you have, studies that are relevant to your systematic review. It makes life so much simpler. After all the studies are 
um, excluded after you've found the studies you want. You can subject the studies to uh, ratings, and we use the strobe rating in terms of determining the bias and quality of the studies. And the strobe rating is based on a 0 to 100% skill. 100 being very good. And so the results were that we found 22 studies in total after excluding um, about, <laughs> well, excluding about 700 studies. And after we were, we reviewed, after I reviewed the text, uh, we excluded its studies because they didn't have male sub, they didn't have female subjects. They were, uh, I think one of them was a brain study looking at gray matter vis-a-vis you know, testosterone would have been interesting, but um, it didn't. It did. It only had male subjects, and so we found four related to autism scores, nine related to autism-related cognition, four related to social outcomes, six on behavioral and play styles. It should be noted that twelve of these studies were conducted by the Baron Cohen Group. The reviewers were very particular to point out that most of these studies were conducted by this group, and they wanted me to uh, report that and uh, really analyze that. So this is just a general idea of the studies that I summarized. Um, the general format of the summary table had to do with each row occupying uh, being occupied by a particular study. And for the four, first four studies, um, the, the first four studies looked at autism. And the studies to come had to do with cognition. So cognition had about nine studies until you got to social functioning, which was another three studies. And then play behavior. And so the results were that there were four studies in total that looked at autism and FT. And all four studies found the heightened prevalence or the heightened level of autism symptoms among males compared to females. Um, fetal testosterone was found to predict autism symptoms in three of three out of four of those studies. The only study that did not replicate that mediation was from outside of Baron Cohen's group. Um, they were interesting and interestingly enough from the same university. They were probably down the hall from one another. Um, this was probably headed by the researcher called Hines. But the general verdict of fetal testosterone and autism is that there is support. The vast majority of studies, the vast majority of um, the population that were tested showed a support for the extreme male brain theory of autism. When looked at um, in terms of its bias and quality, the studies that supported extreme male brain theory of autism were larger and the quality was higher. But Kun et al. also had a higher rate of respond responders um, returning the questionnaire. So whereas the Baron Cohen group had about 40 to 50% of respondents replying and providing the researchers with information about their child. For the Kun study, it was about 80%. So it seemed like the Kun study may have more generalizability, whereas the Baron Cohen study may have, may have more to do with a clinical sample or the specialized nature of their samples. And the results for fetal testosterone cognition um, had five out of nine studies showing support for it. The studies that looked at 
the embedded figures test, which is a, a test that asks the participants to extract out um, a shape from distractors. It's thought to be a test of analysis. That didn't show up to be uh, different between the sexes, so there would not uh, be any mediation. But in terms of dimensions of systemizing, restricted interest, vocabulary size, and um, write your advantage in dichotic listening tasks, which is a task where you signal to the researchers uh, which year you're hearing uh, words from better. Those factors had to do with fetal testosterone. Not only were they, were they different between the sexes, fetal testosterone also had something to do with it across the sexes predicted for these variables beyond sex. So it's very likely that fetal testosterone had something to do uh, with cognition in terms of directionality. In terms of fetal testosterone and social relationships, three out of two studies show support. The areas that show support focused on the use of um, mind-related propositional language. And it had to do with eye contact frequency. The relationship quality, also reading the mind in the eyes, which is a test of cognitive empathy, did not show any sex differences. So it looks like there's some support. And my personally, personal feeling has to do with this being related to an interest in people. That fetal testosterone probably is related to how, um, how much a person is interested in, in other people, regardless, regardless of their ability to understand them. And finally, with fetal testosterone in play, two out of six studies showed support. There were multiple studies looked at looking at um, gendered play styles, and most of those studies did not show support. Uh, most of those studies either did not show sex differences in terms of play, play styles, that males tend to, tending towards rough and tumble play, that males like um, trucks more than dolls, um, but there were two studies that found um, support. I think the study that looked at uh, the preschool's activities inventory, which looked at gender play style and delay of grep, you know, that, that skill in particular seemed to be overshadowed by the overwhelming negative findings. And there's also some relationship between uh, fetal testosterone and delay of gratification, which itself showed sex differences. So generally speaking, it does not seem like fetal testosterone is a big differentiator of sexual dimorphism in terms of behavior. The general verdict seems like that so far studies are not um, antithetical to the extreme male brain theory of autism. In fact, there is some support for it. In particular, the fetal testosterone um, the, the role of fetal testosterone affecting autism symptoms seems to be a pretty good one. Fetal testosterone also seems to mediate cognitive styles related to systemizing and others. There are certain aspects of social relationships that are affected by fetal testosterone. And that's likely related to the large uh, sex differences we find among adult males and females, that males tend to be much more interested in things, and females tend to be much more interested in people. The effect size for that is about Cohen's D equal to 1. Uh, 1.0 or 1.3. It's quite large. But what was surprising, very surprising, is that play styles were likely not to be affected by fetal testosterone. I think 
as early as in the 1940s, Macklin, uh, Maccabee and Jacqueline, who were these early feminist uh, psychological researcher pioneers, they were looking at different aspects of children's development and their sex differences. And it was this, you know, it was very early on that they, they thought that play styles probably had something to do with, uh, with prenatal conditions. They thought that it had something to, to do with fetal testosterone. It's been about 70 years since they first said that. Um, and I guess the research that probably inspired uh, Baron Cohen's work uh, turned out to, to not be supported. But it did lead to other sex differences likely to be have been found. So one of the limitations with this kind of study is that because an extreme male brain theory would concern so many facets, what is considered male is a very difficult uh, philosophical, social, and scientific question. And so we, it's, it's really a grab bag of dimensions, and it's hard to get replication on each of those facets. There also is a need of replication from other groups. Most of those studies are conducted by Baron Cohen, but there was a large number of studies from, for example, the Netherlands and from Canada. Um, I don't know if all of them have the extreme male brain theory in mind. I think m much of the challenge has to do with how invasive the method of amniocentesis is. The research reported generally claim that there is a slight less than 1% increase of miscarriages of those mothers who undergone amniocentesis. Um, so it's not conducted by everyone, and it's sometimes only conducted by those who are perhaps high high risk, perhaps um, perhaps older. Um, so it would be advantageous to find less invasive ways of doing it. That being said, these findings dovetail very well with um, with what we know about adult sex differences. And I think adult sex differences can inform what these child developmental um, phenomena uh, is presenting itself. And so there's, you know, from, from this work, there's also uh, researchers from King's looking at, uh, looking at machine learning paradigms of the brain so they put um, men, men and women with autism under the MRI, and they had the computer learn the patterns of the brain, and then it had the computer reclassify those brains according to gender. And it, I think it turns out roughly 80% of the brains of females with, you know, females were with autism were misclassified as male. So from a, a theoretical uh, machine learning paradigm, it seems like there are some kind of gendered brain pattern or sex brain pattern um, that exists. And again, this is not supposed to be controversial. It isn't controversial because most researchers in the field subscribe to a biopsychosocial model. So I really appreciate your attention and I look forward to your questions.